Hi guys, we are here today to talk to you about the five things that I see most often missed when people are trying to decide whether or not they should own or train. So if you're considering whether or not you should own or train a service dog, then this video is definitely for you. Or if you know somebody who's still considering training a service dog, um, then this video is definitely for them. Now this is not, like I said, now my hair won't stay out of my way today, but we're gonna be all right. Um, this is not a comprehensive list of all the things you should consider before choosing to own or train your dog. These are just the top five things that I see missed most often. After my time spending, I've, I've helped hundreds of owner trainers train their own service dogs by now. And these are the five things that I see people not take into consideration the most often that then later come back to cause a problem in their dog's training. So we're gonna jump right in. So the first thing people fail to consider fully is the puppy phase. Now this of course only applies if you're bringing home a puppy, but if you're bringing home a new rescue or an adolescent, a lot of these same problems are going to still be a part of your early training. Okay, so the puppy phase can be exhausting. Puppies do not sleep through the night for at least a couple of weeks. Um, they need a lot of supervision. They are not very good at entertaining themselves in the beginning. Puppies can be exhausting. And so this is something that everybody has to take into consideration for themselves, whether or not you health-wise can handle the extra stress, the extra lack of sleep, the extra activity that a puppy is going to bring into your world. So an eight week old puppy is really only the equivalent of like maybe a two year old child, three year old child, you know, two or three year old children need constant supervision. They don't entertain themselves very well. They don't um, keep themselves safe very well. Okay, so puppies can be exhausting. And that's something everybody has to decide for themselves. Are you really in a position health-wise or mental health-wise to care for a puppy and go through that lack of sleep and the added stress? Now, if you decide you cannot, of course, there are options for finding an older dog who maybe does sleep through the night or already has some basic training. Um, but of course, with an older dog, you may have some other issues that are in there because if it's a rescue and you don't know the whole history or something like that, so it's just something to consider. Now, the next thing is going to be the fact that service dogs draw a lot of attention. So when you are out in public, service dogs draw a lot of attention. People are going to stare. People are going to ask you questions. You will get the occasional access issue. So depending on where you live in the country, changes kind of how often you're going to get access issues. Um, but trying to bring a service dog into a store, people will sometimes stop you and say, you know, dogs aren't allowed in here. Or is that a service dog? And you'll have to educate people. So depending on you and your disability or how attention from the public makes you feel, Service dogs in some cases make anxiety worse because they bring on so much attention from the public. Now, certainly not always, right? I had no tons and tons of owner trainers, well, and people who didn't owner train who went through an organization, right? Who have a service dog for some type of anxiety disorder or their psychiatric, you know, our psychiatric service dogs. Um, and the service dogs are amazingly helpful and, and all of the benefits, right? But you do have to think about if you're out in public and people are constantly staring at you, is that going to make things worse? Is it going to be offset enough by the dog? Things like that. Now, the third thing that I really see come up a lot is family support. Now, what I mean by family support is anybody living in your home. Um, anybody in your close family or friend circle who doesn't live in your home, you probably should take into consideration, but not quite as much as the people who live in the home with you. Because if the people who live in your home with you are not going to be supportive of this process or are not going to follow your lead and how you want your dog trained or handled, you are going to struggle constantly. I see this happen all the time. My mom, my sister, my roommate, you know, won't help me, won't, won't, um, won't fill in the blank, right? But they're, they're not listening. They're not supportive. They don't want me to have a dog. They don't think this. They don't agree with how I'm training my puppy. 
Um, if the people who live in the home with you are not all on the same page, training a service dog is going to be unbelievably difficult for you. Um, so at the very least, you need everybody in your home to be on the same page. The people who are in your close friend and family circle who don't live in your home, if they're not going to be on the same page with you, you have to be okay with that. And you have to be okay with the fact that you may have to advocate for you or your dog or your dog's training with a very a different opinion than somebody close to you has. And so you have to be comfortable with that. So you really want to take into account primarily the people living in your home, but then also anybody you come into contact with very, very regularly. Um, the most common example, actually, now that I, I, that I can think of, is jumping. So we'll get family who goes, oh, I don't mind if she jumps, right? But that's undermining all of our training because we can't have our service dogs jumping. So we have to know that our family, who, especially who lives in the home, is going to be on the same page. Now, the next thing is your timeline. So one of the common misconceptions that I hear with owner training is that it's faster, okay? Because organizations often have long wait lists, and so it's faster to train your own service dog. But I'm going to tell you that unless the organization's wait list is three years or longer, it is probably not actually faster to train your own service dog. Now, you may get some tasks on board with a young dog who can start to be helpful in your home very quickly. Um, that is possible. But our service dogs, well, they don't have to be service dogs, right? just any dog. Our dogs are not adults until they hit the age of two. Until they are two years old, they are not adults, which means they are not mentally mature enough to handle full-time service work. Going out with you everywhere, doing all the tasks, doing the whole thing full-time, they are not ready for that until they're two years old. So I see people owner train because they need to have a service dog in the next 12 months, or they're going on this trip in 18 months and they need to have their dog's training done by then. And that is one of the fastest ways to set yourself up to fail is to have that strict timeline that you're trying to meet. Okay, so that's like I said, if an organization has a two-year waiting list, it's going to be two years until your owner trained dog is fully trained anyway. Um, if you start to see, you know, those three or five year waiting lists, then yeah, training your own service dog could be faster. But do consider if you're trying to stick to a tight timeline, that's a really good way to set you and your dog up for failure. Now, the last thing, and this is a big thing, is access to the things that you need. So we're going to run through a handful of, of um, things here, but I see this come up a lot. So for example, the first thing on my list is dogs. You have to have access to other dogs, both for socialization and for training around so that you can teach your service dog to ignore other dogs. Now, you don't necessarily need other dogs in your home, in your own home, and you don't necessarily need lots of friends with other dogs, but you are going to need access to other dogs, preferably well-behaved dogs, to aid you in your training. Now, you can work around this in a variety of ways, including finding an in-person trainer to help you or taking group classes or something like that, but you will need access to other dogs to train your own service dog. The next thing is other people, including children. This one comes up a lot. I hear people, well, I don't have anybody to help me. I don't have helpers. I don't have, you know. In order to train your service dog, you are going to need access to other people. You're going to need people who follow your instructions to help you with your training. If you are training any type of task that involves other people, like getting help or something, you're going to need access to a bunch of other people to help you train that task. Now, again, there are workarounds here, depending on where you live. Um, you know, depending on where you live, the public tends to be better behaved or less well behaved around service dogs. There are workarounds here, but you're going to need to be able to train around other people. The next thing you need is other ac access to other animals, including livestock. We have to have our service dogs be well behaved around cats, small pets like rabbits or hamsters, horses, cows. These are things our service dogs have to be exposed to, trained around, and capable of handling in their working life. 
So you have to be, you either have to have access or you have to be comfortable getting access to things like horses or goats or rabbits or whatever it is. Now, sometimes there are pet stores around that have these things in cages we can go train. You know, PetSmart sometimes has them. Um, if you have a friend with horses, great. But if you don't know anybody with horses or you don't live anywhere where horses are around, you're going to have to be able to find some place to train your dog around horses. And I use horses as an example a lot because they pop up randomly and when you're least expecting it is what I tend to find. A lot of people think, oh, I don't need to do that because um, you know, we, don't, we don't ever spend any time around horses. And then all of a sudden, randomly, there's a horse you know, pulling a carriage down Main Street and you haven't, you know, you haven't like prepared your dog for that. So we need to be able to have access to something like a horse for training. And the last thing, well, there's actually one more thing after this, but the next thing is the ability to run public access training sessions. Now, what I mean by this is when you begin the socialization process and then as you move into public access, you need your training sessions to be pretty short. You have to be able to go to Walmart to spend 10 minutes training your dog to come home again. So one of the issues that pops up a lot for my students is people who rely on public transportation. This makes this a lot harder because in order to get your dog to somewhere for training, you have to ride public access. That doesn't make this impossible, but it is something to consider. If you're reliant on public access, how are you going to be taking a puppy or a, or a dog of any age into public for these short training sessions? Okay, so it's something you need to consider and plan for ahead of time. Um, I live out pretty far in the middle of nowhere. So in order for me to get, I, have a, I live in a very small town and I have five or six stores here that are great for training dogs. But if I wanna get a, beyond those those spaces, I have to travel at least 30 minutes to get to the next store. Um, and I have to be willing to drive 30 minutes to train for five to do 30 minutes home. Okay, your service dog puppy is not going to be ready to run errands with you until later in his training. So when we have a young or a green dog, it's really important that we aren't going, oh, I'll just train him when I go to get uh, groceries or when I go to do this or fill in the blank. Um, because our dogs really aren't going to be ready for that until later on down the road. Now, the thing that I forgot, as far as access to the things you need, the one that I forgot to put on my list here on my slides is the finances to take care of a dog. Now, this is one that will come up a lot more often in your research. If you're trying to decide whether or not you should own or train, you will find this one in other articles and other videos more often. Um, but I really do find people who who they, they rescue a dog from a shelter, which is fine. We can definitely have great service dogs come from shelters, um, but we rescue a dog from a shelter because the cost is low and then don't have the finances to take the dog to the vet or to go see a trainer if something arises in our training or to go to a group class or something like that. Um, so you have to have, in order to do this, you have to have the finances for, of course, food, treats, training aids, you're going to need money for veterinary care, which doesn't come up as regularly as we would like to think. Um, I mean, yes, they need yearly exams. There's the vaccines and blood draws, but our dogs get sick. UTIs happen. Um, kennel cough happens. You know, hot spots happen. And you have to, you need to have the money to be able to take your dog to the vet. So we do have to have enough finances to care for the dog in order to do owner training. Um, so those are kind of the five things that I see missed most often when it comes to considering whether or not that you should own or train your own dog. Now, once you do your research, because again, this is not a comprehensive list of all the things you should consider, you should definitely be you know, researching this in other places as well. Um, but once you decide to own or train, remember the next step is choosing the dog. And I see a lot of mistakes made there as well. But I have lots of videos and I have a whole blog post on choosing your own service dog. And I'll put those links in the description of this video. Um, but in review, remember, so the things that I really see people not fully consider before bringing home a dog are pup, the puppy phase and how exhausting and stressful this phase can be. Um, the amount of attention that service dogs draw. So service dogs draw a lot of attention in public and you have to be comfortable enough with that. Um, Family support. The people in your home really need to be on the same page. It's, it's imperative that the people who live in your home are all on the same page. 
Again, the timeline, if you have a strict timeline, you are just setting your dog and you up for failure. And you have to have access to the things you need, which including finances to be able to do veterinary care, training fees if needed, things like that. You also need access to other dogs, other people, including children, other animals, including livestock, and transportation and the ability to run public access training sessions. Now, again, you don't necessarily have to have close friends with all of these things, but you need to consider if you don't have a bunch of friends with dogs or if you don't have friends with children or you don't have friends with horses or you rely on public access or pub <laughs> public transportation, how are you going to train your, dogs or your dog around other dogs or around other people, or around horses? Or how are you going to do those short training sessions in public if you're relying on public transportation? You need to think about these things ahead of time. So I hope that this was helpful. If you have any questions about this topic, go ahead and throw them into the comments. If you found this video helpful, um, please hit that like button and then share it anywhere that you think other owner trainers might also find it helpful. And like I said, I will put the links to some of our resources on choosing a service dog candidate in the description of this video. Um, because once you do make the decision to owner train, then the next step is going to be finding the, the right candidate for you. And I see people make a lot of mistakes there as well. Um, okay, so I'm just seeing if we had any questions pop up while I was talking. Um, so Lindsay says, I have a YouTube page about my service dog and other info. May I share this info on my YouTube page? Um, you can, sure, you can definitely share. This replay will be up on YouTube as well. Um, so you guys can absolutely share the info or share the video anywhere that you uh, think other people will find it helpful. Um, so that's it. I'll be back uh, next week again because we're going to start doing these Facebook Lives regularly again. So if you have any questions at all on this topic, you can throw them in the comments here, or you can always check out our um, free Facebook group, Train Your Service Dog with Confidence, because that's a great place to ask questions, especially on this topic. If you're still considering owner training, we have thousands of owner trainers in there who can definitely give you their insight. Um, all right, guys, well, have a great day. We'll see you later.